Hi everyone, thank you for coming and welcome to our Docker and Education panel. So first of all, I would like to introduce you to our panelists. First we have Sylvain Kalash, co-founder of Holberton School. Then we have Chris Huey, developer evangelist at Galvanize. Then in the back there we have Michael Irwin, application architect, adjunct faculty instructor, master's student at Virginia Tech, and a newly appointed Docker captain. Then we have Annie Hedgepeth, cloud automation engineer and student of a Docker course at Pluralsight. So the reason they are all here on this panel is because they are all affiliated with higher, educa higher education programs. So we would like to discuss with them their experiences learning and teaching Docker in a structured environment. So we've prepared some questions that I will ask them in turn. First of all, this question is for everyone. Who are you and can you please explain a bit more about the educational institution that you're affiliated with? Uh, yes, Jesus. <laughs> um, so, like she said, I'm Chris Huey. Um, I work at Galvanize. There's actually one in Austin, if you haven't heard of it. We essentially train on uh, web development and data science, along with have a lot of uh, seed companies and smaller companies work out of our space. Uh, so that is, that's kind of what we do, and, and my role there is to educate around Docker, um, both for people that are trying to new uh, to Docker, and also for people um, that are, you know, DevOps developers full time and just trying to level up their skills. That's kind of uh, what we strive to be is a giant nerd castle where everybody can, can learn whatever, uh, at wherever stage in their career they are, so. Hi, I'm Annie Hedgepeth, and I actually am probably the only one on the panel that's not involved in higher education. I um, am new to technology. I have a career that's about uh, nine months old or so. And um, so I know a lot about learning because I don't have a degree in IT. I have a degree in film, actually. And so I've been sort of a professional student of technology for over the past year. And so I think they wanted to pick my brain because of that. And as uh, Lisa mentioned, I'm Michael Irwin. Um, I'm from Virginia Tech, go Hokies. Um, and um, I'm primarily a, a developer there. Um, I also, uh, I'm helping train um, folks within IT and starting to branch out to students, um, working with Lisa's Campus Ambassadors Program and, and helping students learn how to use Docker um, for various projects or open source stuff. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, I'm also a Docker captain. So uh, there's various responsibilities and, you know, uh, presentation, teaching assignments, that, you know, I, I fulfill in that role as well. Hi, uh, my name is Sylvain. I am the co-founder of Holberton School. Uh, we are a two-year alternative to college, training highly skilled software engineers. Uh, we are using uh, project-based and peer learning methodology, uh, meaning that we have no formal teachers and no lectures. Students are learning by practicing and collaborating with their peers. And uh, we want to provide high quality education to the most at scale. And uh, Docker is part of uh, the recipe for that. So Sylvain, this question is for you then. Coding schools have become a big thing recently. How are you innovating or differentiating Holberton from, uh, from other competitors? Yeah, so I think today if you want to get into the tech industry, you have basically two possibilities. Um, the century old methodology, uh, which is colleges and university, and the um, you know, newcomer in the industry, which are uh, coding boot camps. Um, we are sitting like in the middle of, of the two. Um, we are uh, like, I think we can split like the differences in, in three parts. Uh, the first part is in terms of what type of candidate we are accepting. Uh, you do not need any prior programming experience, any diploma. Uh, any type of like GPA. Uh, we select our students based on their motivation, talent, and ability to collaborate. Um, our application process is fully automated, uh, meaning that there is no human intervention, and we manage to remove with this uh, discrimination and human bias. Um, and we have amazing um, like number of in terms of diversity, 40% uh, women. Uh, the age goes from 17 to 58. 
and 16% um, of um, our students are non-white, where people who were cameraman, musician, uh, in marketing, fruit picker, cashier, you name it. Um, so once they are accepted, uh, one big difference is that we are teaching students not only on the latest um, hype tool like Ember.js or the latest framework, but we are also teaching students on the fundamental of software engineering, uh, like with low-level programming algorithm data structure, uh, high-level programming with uh, web application API databases, and then system administration, uh, how to manage one server, two servers, three servers, right? How do you scale it? How do you use load balancer? How do you make sure they are secure? Um, one key element at Holberton is that we have no lecture and no formal teachers, so students learn by practicing, by working on project, pretty much like what you are doing at work, right? Your manager come to you, hey, can you build this feature? Can you fix this, right? And then it's up to you to choose the best tool to do the task. That's what we are doing with our students, uh, along with guidance from mentors, and actually we have a lot of um, mentors who are working at Docker and who are supporting the community by coming to gift talks and also doing um, coaching session. Um, and I think the, then the, what students uh, get out of the curriculum is like practical skills to find a job right away. And we've placed students at top companies like Apple, Scality, Dropbox, um, Docker, LinkedIn, and NASA. But also because they, have, they didn't become software engineer by listening to someone, but by themselves grabbing the knowledge and tools they need to achieve something, they basically develop self-teaching um, skills that they can reuse when they will be working in a company and they will be able to continue to grow as a professional. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the three main differences um, compared to other folks in the education industry. And I would like to ask Chris the same question. What do you feel is a differentiating factor for Galvanize? Um, so for Galvanize, the a lot of our like curriculum, uh, which is ever-changing because the tech industry is ever-changing, um, is really rooted in industry. Um, the, if you talk to our CEO and, and kind of our people that really implement our, our curriculum, our goal is not to necessarily serve the student as much as it is to be closely tied to industry. Uh, and with that, the students will come because the education is really uh, on par with what you would experience in a normal working environment. Our program uh, for web developers at Mint is a little different. It's six months, um, nine to five, 20 or so more hours outside of that. I, I, I'm from the Phoenix campus. Uh, we actually have eight campuses, Denver, Seattle, uh, San Francisco, here, Phoenix, New York. Um, and in, my, in, in the Phoenix campus, uh, there's students there every time from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, so it is really what you get out of it. And when I talk to our students, a lot of it's also about you just gained this superpower practically. Uh, and the invigoration behind that is so, so engaging uh, that we give them as much latitude to really get those six months and be as immersed uh, as they can. So that, that's why uh, d specifically Docker in, in our education, it matters because that matters to industry. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what differentiates us. Great, thank you. So the next question is for everyone. So we can go around in turns. How did you first hear about Docker? And what is the number one pro problem that Docker has solved for you or you think will solve for you or your organization or community? Well, my answer will probably be a little bit different than everybody else's. But um, I honestly didn't know what Docker was until like nine months ago or something, because um, the way that I got started in technology was that I learned, a, a, first of all, I learned this um, compliance automation framework called InSpec. And, um, and then from that, I sort of learned invertedly about IT. And so I kind of learned, okay, if I'm, if I'm automating these compliance audits, then um, this is what that means. And so I learned about IT sort of in reverse order. And uh, then whenever I started working as a cloud automation engineer, I discovered Docker and, uh, and what it does. And you can kind of learn about software invertedly also um, with Docker. And so 
I learned how to use it first. I, I took a course, a plural site course on Docker, and um, the teacher named Wes Higby, he was talking about how as, you, as you're writing your Docker file, you're, you're learning about all of these different components, and if you have no sort of background, relative knowledge of IT, then you can um, use that as a tool to learn more about, about everything um, as you're doing it. And then, conversely, you can learn about um, how software is supposed to work properly if you're just using a container, if you're just using an image. And so, um, so I forgot the question. But <laughs> Blam. Sorry, what's oh, the problem right. that Docker has solved for you? Right, so, so the problem that it has solved for me is that it allows for more inverted learning. And I, I really think that's a really cool thing, uh, sort of an unexpected thing about Docker is that you can really use it. You don't have to be afraid that it's too uh, complex, like containerization and isolation and all that. Oh, it's, it's a, kind of a, an advanced uh, topic. but when you think about it, it really simplifies things for people that are learning because you can isolate everything and it's simple and clean and nice and neat. And so that's a, a great tool for, for people to use in, in learning. So uh, our story with Docker started about two years ago and uh, I was on a development team and we, as part of our development process, as we start working on a new feature, we've got a new feature branch um, using Git and so we're working on this, those individual features and we get to the point that, well, before we want to merge that feature branch into our main code base, we want it to be accepted by our, our acceptance team. And, uh, but we need a, a separate deployed environment, an isolated environment just for that feature branch. And so we, we started looking at Docker to help solve this problem for us. Um, so our, our use was very, I guess, um, driven based on our development processes. But since then, we've, we've seen many different aspects of it. Um, at Virginia Tech, we're seeing a lot of research grants that are, as part of even the requirements, are saying, well, in, in, instead of just providing the source code um, as part of the research output, it's also, well, you also need a reproducible environment to run that research in. And Docker provides a great opportunity to say, well, well hey, here's the environment that we ran this Python script or whatever to, that produced this research. And so now it's easy reproducible research. Um, another project that I've been affiliated with at the university is uh, the Virginia Cyber Range, um, which is an, it, it's an incredible project going on there. Um, I encourage you to, to check it out, virginiacyberrange.org. But one of the ideas there is, well, we want students to be able to try out these um, cybersecurity aspects, um, these different lessons. And uh, many, many students, this may be the, even their first intro to Linux or, you know, how do I SSH into a server? How do I set up stuff? How do I install all these different packages and everything? And using Docker containers now, we can basically already, rather than shipping them a VM and, okay, now you have to start this VM and everything, we basically can just spin up a container and everything's already set up ready for them to go. And so there, the, the amount of time that it takes for somebody to actually s sit down and start working on it on a project and not worry so much of how do I set up the environment to even try out this new stuff, um, that, that time has been dramatically reduced and there's been a lot of really good benefits that have come out of the instruction uh, for these, these various uh, topics in, in that particular case around security. Uh, yeah, so for me, uh, the best thing about Docker is really the community, uh, and that's actually how I, I first got into it, is because the, the Phoenix specifically captains and people that are uh, really pushing our community forward are amazing at, at really preaching Docker and uh, being really great ambassadors for Docker as a whole. Um, also, Probably the plural site course was taught by a Arizona native. Uh, if it's Dan Walleen, um, he also lives in Phoenix, so that's awesome. But my my uh, my first experience really using it in development was I was uh, working at a company that was really going into the mindset of continuous deployment, um, and so we were really having to take a lot of our monolithic older apps and, and kind of try to put them in a dockerized containers and, and really utilize what docker is made for in, in our entire stack. Um, so that was my first in practice use of it. 
Um, so I first heard about Docker because uh, before it was even named Docker, uh, at the time it was .cloud. And actually my uh, co-founder, Julien Barbier, was working there. Uh, he was the director of marketing and community. And so um, after a few months working for .cloud, they decided to pivot to Docker. Uh, so Julian was the one who bootstrapped the, the great community, and I agree. Like I think, like one of the great things about Docker is it's like community that is like literally all over the world and very supportive. Um, and I think like uh, Docker for Holberton School is solving two things. Um, the first one is scale. Um, so the, like today's education is uh, the, the bottleneck is basically teacher, right? Like you have great education if you have great teachers, and that's basically the limiting factor. At Holberton, we have no formal teacher, so we can easily scale. Um, you know, from like training hundred or thousand of students is basically the same thing for us. Um, and so, uh, application uh, is something touchy, where you know we cannot assess thousands of candidates, right? Like we are a small team, we are only six person, and so our application process is is powered by Docker. And so the second thing also that's interesting in terms of scales is that students, when they are working on projects, they are pushing everything to GitHub. And then uh, we have workers who pull the code from GitHub, push this to Docker containers, and then we apply the seri series of tests that will basically check if their code respects the requirement, is not crashing, is handling edge cases, and so on. And we can do so because container can basically launch in a matter of seconds, right? Um, so we, like, instead of using a teacher to manually review the work, we use like basically workers with Docker containers. Great, thank you. So this next question is more for Chris and Michael. When you run a workshop, what do you do to try and make it one that people will remember? All right, so a lot of the workshops that I've run, uh, at least the things that have worked well for me, have been, uh, um, th there's a couple different things that I've, that I've done to help out. So one would be, first of all, make sure that people know what they need to do before they get there. Um, so if they need to install Docker, if they even need to bring their laptops, you know, that's important. You, you would think that people would remember to bring their laptops, but a lot of people forget that sometimes. Um, so make sure that people know what, what's going on. Um, but then also, actually some of the most successful workshops I've had weren't ones that I just said, all right, here are the steps, now go and do it and let me know if you have a question. The, the most successful ones that I've had are the ones in which I'm actually doing the workshop with them. And we're, and we're working on it step by step, and then it gives me an opportunity to, to explain things as we go along the way. Um, because people are gonna have questions, and people are, uh, tend to be afraid to ask questions. So if I'm doing it with them, and I can explain things along the way, it's a lot easier for them to say, well, hey, help, explain that again one more time. And so those, that's what's really made things sink in a lot better, and uh, have made it, made it a lot more memorable for people to be able to come. Of course, like food and swag and all that kind of stuff help out, but, uh, um, of course, just being there with them and, and really trying to help them really understand what's going on is honestly what makes it most memorable, at least in my experience. Yeah, so for me, the first thing I would say is tell people with Microsoft machines to come an hour earlier than the people with Linux machines. Um, and in that, it's, it's very powerful, though, because for the, the last couple that I've ran, there's, there's, this, there's this definitely gap of Windows users and kind of going in. Uh, but again, our community is awesome, so there's usually like 10 people that are going around just exploring BIOSes to uh, flip on virtualization, uh, which makes it so you can actually get to the workshop uh, relatively easy. Uh, I also have offered mimosas to people uh, while they have to wait because there is that like weird gap time. Uh, other than that, it really is, it, our philosophy in in kind of the Docker workshops that that I ran have been a direct ripoff of our classroom, the way that we do stuff in the classroom, which is you teach, you let people build stuff on their own, you be available, but you also encourage them to work with others to solve their problems. Then you go back, you teach some more, you let them on their loose. So it really is uh, building these synapses in your brain where I'm not just teaching you because there's a huge gap between knowing something and doing something, uh, and Docker is no different. That, that's persistent in technology, is, is really you, by doing, lock something into your brain um, much more than you would, you know, reading an article, reading a book, 
um, watching a video, you have to also do it. Uh, so both together are very powerful. So that's one thing that I would absolutely say has worked great uh, for my workshops and the people that, that come uh, to learn. One of the things I'd say is probably an anti-pattern is situations where you are just presenting um, to, without really going anywhere into, into something that like, it's okay to show introductions or even like touch on high level features, but you really do wanna direct somebody even after presentation to somewhere to practice their skills. So um, even for like shorter meetups where it's an hour, the Docker tutorials are incredible. Um, if you haven't checked them out, they're from beginner to intermediate to advanced and they're really great. So one thing that I really encourage that presenter to do is look at these, build something kind of that fits in here and then when you're done or at certain points direct people to go to that and really uh, still when they go home give them something more to really, to really um, quench their thirst of knowledge and, and really get deeper into Docker. Um, so that's, that's what I'd say is things that have worked really great for me on my workshops. Yeah, I'd like to double down on that. I think that software engineering is pretty much a craft and it's by practicing that one can master it, right? And so you can only learn so much from someone who is just telling you how you should do something, right? Like a baker won't make amazing bread just by listening or reading a book. A tennis player won't be amazing at playing tennis by looking videos, right? It's part of it for sure, but I think like the learning by doing methodology is one of the best um, to become a great software engineer. And I think we've all seen our, met in our life like self-taught software engineer, and they are usually among the best because they, they, they learn everything by doing. Um, another thing that I would add is um, collaboration. Um, in regular education, when uh, students are helping each other, we tend to call this cheating. Uh, but in the company world, it's called, co it's called collaboration. It's just essential for company uh, to work well. Like companies are the, 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 the fruit of successful teams, right? And you need individuals who are able to help each other. And a team can go as far as its weakest member. So it's, it's just crucial uh, that students um, who will later become software engineers are learning software engineering by collaborating with their peers. Great, thank you. And do, you, do any of you feel that your teaching method changes depending on who your audience is or how old they are, for example? Um, so at Holberton School, we have students from 17 to uh, 58, uh, literally all works of life. We have the same curriculum for everybody, but we do have different level of uh, tasks. Uh, so let's say you are a newcomer, or perhaps uh, your learning curve is not as steep as other people. Um, you have to focus on uh, the mandatory tasks, but if you are a quick learner or perhaps you want to go deeper, for example, in low-level programming, then you can um, go and work on more advanced tasks. Uh, for me, it's, it's usually a pretty wide range of people that show up, uh, just because that is Phoenix community. Uh, even uh, workshops that are introduction to Docker, you still get people that know a lot about Docker in there, which is awesome, and I love that. Uh, so something that we've had in, in one of our workshops is we actually had like stretch goals. So we had a GitHub repo where we were going over the first six uh, kind of things, um, you know, how to set up a Docker file. But the, then um, the presenter actually had about another seven, uh, like five or six other things that people, like if somebody wanted to get into Swarm or, or kind of different stuff like that, that were also catered to more advanced people at the same time if they wanted to just go on their own but be in an environment of learners. So that's, that's what I found um, reigns true for the communities that I go. It's, it's not the level of knowledge around the topic as much as it's people want to be around others that are trying to learn something. Because um, that's quite frankly as developers what the one thing we know that will not change in development is that we will have to learn something new. Um, so I think we all kind of gravitate towards communities of constant learning. Uh, no matter where we're at, so. Um, so I told you all about inverted learning earlier and this guy, Wes Higby, who I keep mentioning because it was really cool. Um, 
he had mentioned inverted learning in his Pluralsight course, and so I went to his blog and I was really interested to see if he had anything else to say about it, and he, and he hadn't yet, but he had this post on um, relative learning. And so he talks about how like today you know how to work your, your smart TV because you grew up with TVs, right? Like I, my very first TV was a little 13 inch black and white with a knob, you know? And, but all of the different TVs along the years have taught me how to use my current TV, right? And so a lot of people, a, a lot of y'all, um, have that knowledge of IT from, you know, I don't know, you, you probably, I didn't even play video games when I was a kid. So like, like there, I, you might even um, have really far back from when you were a kid. Um, but somebody else like me who didn't have much of a background in IT or anything like that, or video games, um, is learning in an inverted way, like I told y'all a minute ago. And so I guess whenever you're teaching Docker or whatever else it is, know your audience and like, are they going to learn it in an inverted way um, where you have to start from scratch and dig in or in a relative way where they know sort of um, about everything else and then they can make assumptions about what they're learning based off of what they already know. And that's actually a really good point that she brought up too of, uh, and I think these other two guys would, would agree with me as well, that it's, the, the important thing is to try to know and uh, know, the, know your audience as the best that you can um, and, and try to tailor it towards them. I, I don't think I've necessarily said, okay, I'm gonna work, I'm presenting to old people, so I'm gonna present it this way versus, okay, I'm no, but, but what, I, what I have done quite a bit is, all right, I know that I'm gonna be presenting to this particular group on campus, for example, in their traditional Java shop. So if I'm using examples using PHP or Ruby or Node or something like that, they're gonna have no idea what I'm talking about. So then I'll, I'll completely customize the Docker files or the things that I'm presenting to them to at least be familiar with, familiar to them. Um, and so that, that's something that I do a lot. Um, I'm trying to figure out, all right, who is it that I'm presenting to? What might they already be familiar with? And then how can I tailor my presentation towards that so it makes, makes more sense to them? Um, and, and there's a good chance I've already talked to them before and know some of the heartaches that they've come, uh, that they've run through, um, you know, with version dependencies or you know, all, the, all this kind of stuff. And so there, there's, a, there's a good chance I can then tailor towards those complaints and those frustrations that they've had and say, all right, this is how this solves that problem. Um, and, and that's typically how I try to tailor things myself. Thank you. So, Annie, you talked about inverted learning. Does that mean that you agree with Chris Sylvain and Michael that the more traditional lecture style um, classes don't work for learning something like Docker? <laughs> well, that's a loaded question. Um, again, like, I think that everybody learns, uh, it just depends on how much background knowledge you need, right? So, like, um, I totally agree that hands-on learning is the best way to go. Sometimes you do have to sort of sit in a classroom, whether it be online or in person or whatever, for a little while to get the background knowledge that you need to get, but then, like, implement it as soon as possible and use it as soon as possible, for sure. And, um... What is it about Docker in particular that makes either teaching or learning coding easier? Well, when I was first starting out, um, even just create, I created a website on using a uh, Jekyll template and, uh, and using GitHub pages. And like, I was so frustrated and like discouraged, I guess, because I kept on coming up with these uh, things I didn't know what to do with. Like, gym dependencies. I was like, what is that? I don't even know what that is. And I was so frustrated and just, and then I learned like months later, I could have done it all in a Docker container a, a, with a Jekyll image. And I was like, oh man. So, um, so just simplifying it and, and giving you, um, um, sort of a clean space to work with is really, really nice. And, yeah, and and I think she pretty much hit it right on right on the head that you know many times in which I, I've been working with uh, you know students or something like that, and it's all right. Hey, before you can start this exercise, you're going to have to install A, B, C, D through probably X, Y, and Z, and and you're going to have to configure your system this way, la di da, and uh, and yeah, they beat their head on the wall many many times, 
Um, but you know, the cool thing with Docker, as we all know, are, I can give you this image and you're already ready to go. Or you can, all right, here's a Docker file, you can build it out yourself. And so they, they've already got this, this, this starting point that everything's already ready to go. But then it also gives the, the opportunity for the student to say, well, hey, I am interested in how, how was that actually built. And since they have the Docker file, they can see exactly how it was built. They can see the steps that I took to set up that environment. They can ask questions if they want. And then for me personally, since we're, we're looking for potential interns as well, I, I'm looking for the people that are asking those kind of questions and, and want to know more and want to dig deeper. And so th for, for us within our IT department, those are potentially really good candidates to, to, to pull in and, and, and for internship opportunities, et cetera. Um, so I agree with everything he said, and I, I would. Um, I think one thing that at Alberton made a, b a big difference for us is uh, the speed and the flexibility of Docker. Uh, we are training DevOps and SRE types of students, and so they need to bas basically experiment and play with a variety of, uh, you know, like distribution and system, and also they tend to break them. And so, you know, when you had the bare metal machine, you had to reformat the OS and it would take like a while. When it's a virtual machine, it's still heavy, right? You cannot launch too many of them. It still takes minutes to start. With a container, now, now with a matter of seconds, you can get a new machine and get started again. Uh, it's also very easy for us to, uh, you know, pre prepare uh, pre-packed images with some stacks or some bugs that we int intentionally put it inside. And it's up to them to finish the work or debug the machine. So um, I, like for us, it, Docker really brought us to the next stage in terms of how efficiently we can train SRE and DevOps, DevOps type of people. I have a very interesting theory, and it's that every developer has a package or a couple of libraries that are like their kryptonite in life. Um, for me, it's OpenCV, uh, but it's you spend four or five hours of your life trying to configure and figure out what broke down there. Docker made that so I really don't have to ha deal with those problems, um, specifically around some of these older scientific um, packages that are just painful. And I, I think we all, we all have different packages that we spend as much time configuring as we do learning the package itself. So that's, that's scalable where you don't have to solve problems that somebody else has solved for you. And that's, that's why technology is so innovative and can build so fast. So I think that's just an extension of uh, what is people building bridges for other people. So just this last Sunday, I was uh, talking with a, a friend at church who's an accounting professor. And uh, you know he, he likes doing a couple Python scripts. And uh, he was writing a couple Python scripts to scrape um, data from the SEC website, you know, stock exchange, blah, 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 blah whatever. I, I don't understand most of that, but whatever. Um, and so he was like, All right, I want to be able to share this script with a friend of mine, another professor, who's going to take it. And then, but he wants slightly different material. Um, how can I do that? And I was like, I have an answer for you. And, uh, and so I'm going to be working with him to basically do this. And so it's allowing even non-technical people that, that may have a very rough idea of, OK, I want to do something with Python. I don't know how to set up my environment. I don't know how to do all this stuff. But it's going to allow this, this professor to write a script and share it with colleagues that have no technical understanding. But all they have to do is install Docker, and they can be up and running and, and taking advantage of that. Great, thank you very much. So finally, would you like to share any last minute tips and tricks for helping people move along their learning Docker journey? Just do it. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's actually what I just tell a lot of people. Uh, I think uh, the perception of the learning curve, uh, while there is a learning curve, I think the perception of it is greater than what it actually is. And uh, of course, you can get as deep in, into it as you want, but just just start doing it. Just play with it, and don't be afraid to ask questions. I mean, as was mentioned earlier, there's a fantastic community around, and and the more you encourage people to to do that, they don't necessarily have to go into Slack and you know join all these teams and everything. But there are people there that want to help. Um, you know, the, I, as Lisa mentioned, you know, I'm a, I'm a captain myself, and that's because I've been very involved with the community. There there are many many people out there that want to help. And so that's, that's what I encourage. Just go out and do it. Just get started. Don't be afraid. You're going to make mistakes, but who doesn't make mistakes? Just, just go out and do it.
Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very similar. I think uh, one tips for the de developer or student who might not have the chance to learn Docker in their current school or job is to work on side projects. Um, I think that when you are building something that's meaningful to you, you will learn much better than when it's just material that you receive in school. Um, that's something I personally experienced when uh, I was studying software engineering. I learned a ton by basically building side projects. And I would um, like join Michael. Like uh, There is an amazing community of uh, people on, on Slack, right? You don't even need to uh, move out of your chair, and uh, they are always willing to help. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm on the same thing. Just get plugged into your Docker community that's local. Um, you know, wherever that, introduce yourself to the captain, um, add the Slack channel, uh, get involved in DevOps days, whatever it is uh, to really be in that community because the Docker community is awesome. Uh, and that, I, I feel like the most deterrent for people in learning anything and why they fall out is that there's just a problem that pisses them off to the point of they're like, whatever. Um, if you're really in the community, you'll never have a problem that will frustrate you that much because there is always somebody to help. Thank you very much. So finally, I would just like to talk really briefly about our Docker and higher education program that the community team at Docker has been working on to help students learn and use Docker. So first of all, we've created a Docker and higher education community. When you join this community, you'll get access to our free Docker Student Developer Kit, latest product updates and release notes, special discounts for community events, for example, DockerCon, chance to get priority access to product betas, the opportunity to become a Docker Campus Ambassador, which I'll talk more about on the next slide, um, and also a listing in the Docker community directory and Slack teams that they just talked about, access to uh, the various channels, including the Docker Students channel. So the, Donk, the Docker Campus Ambassador program is a program where we onboard student leaders on campuses and provide them with support and materials to help them bring together other students who are interested in, use, develop, and support the Docker e ecosystem. As you can see, there are a variety of benefits to this, joining this program, including technical and professional training directly from the Docker team. We'll always be on hand to help you with problems and to help you expand your community on your campus. You'll also receive privileged access to the latest Docker editions, as well as free tickets to community events such as DockerCon and, of course, lots of swag. These are the requirements. Um, the campus ambassador must be a student of any discipline, doesn't have to be computer science. They must have a prior understanding of Docker technology, leadership skills, a passion to mentor, good relations with faculty on campus, but most importantly, enthusiasm. If you would like to join the Docker student community, if you're a student or you know someone who's a student, you can come up and I'll give you a flyer with the URLs that were just up there. Um, but thank you very much. If you have any questions about anything we discussed today, feel free to email me at lisa.m at docker.com. Thank you to our amazing panelists today. <laughs>